The Buddha called himself a Gamma Widen, which means someone who teaches action. And that's one of the central points of his teaching, is that we choose our actions, our actions are real. They give consequences, and those consequences depend on the state of mind with which we do the action. And so the Buddha had a tendency to look at everything in terms of an action. You hold to a view. He didn't look simply at the view. He would look at the way you hold to it, what happens when you hold to it, what that action does. Even your sense of who you are, he said, was an action. He called it the action of I-making and my-making. And it's something we do all the time. It's a strategy based on a judgment. What's worth holding on to? What's not worth holding on to? Because when you have an I or a sense of self, there's always going to be a sense of a not-self as well as a boundary line. And for most of us, the problem is that we take on one identity at one point in time, and pretty quickly after that we can take on another identity and then another. We have a whole crowd of identities in our mind. And one of our main problems is that these different identities that we create can often be at cross-purposes. You're one person today, you're another person tomorrow, and the person you are tomorrow wants to destroy what you did today. So the question sometimes becomes, who's the real me in here? And the Buddha saw that that was not the right question. The right question is, how can you create some order among your different senses of self and not-self, so that you can find true happiness? Because for him, that was the whole purpose of his teaching. We have this power through our ability to act, and to act in ways that have consequences, that we can train the mind to act consistently in ways that lead eventually to a happiness that's not fabricated, not conditioned, something that doesn't change. And that, of course, is going to require bringing some order into your senses of self, the way you create your sense of identity. And also how you use the concept of not-self, when and where to use these different concepts. So it really does lead to true happiness. We hear so much about not-self, not-self, that people tend to forget that the Buddha also said, you know, the self is its own mainstay. You use yourself as your governing principle. Otherwise, when you're tempted to leave the path, you remind yourself that you got into this path because you saw that you were suffering and you wanted to put an end to suffering. If you abandon the path, does it mean you don't love yourself anymore, you don't care about your, the question of whether you suffer or not? You realize that it's for your own good that you follow this path. And that's one of the reasons you want to stick with it. So he has your nurture three kinds of skillful selves. The self that feels competent to follow this path and that actually makes the effort to develop the skills that are needed. And then there's a self that's going to enjoy the results. And you want that self to be a real connoisseur of what happiness really is. So you don't settle for a second best or third best or fourth. And then there's a self that watches these things and passes judgment. This has to be trained too, so that it passes judgment in a way that's really conducive to staying on the path, and not getting you discouraged. At the same time, not letting you just get off with not doing your best. So we use these different senses of self to get on the path, to stay on the path, and to improve our performance on the path. And as I said, once you create a sense of self, there's a boundary, and outside of that boundary is not-self. So while you're trying to stay with the path, things that would get in the way, you have to brand as not-self. You have to perceive them as not-self. 
So in both cases, your sense of self and your sense of not self are strategies. They've been strategies all along. Now you, however, you want to create a more consistent strategy, a wiser strategy. For instance, with the precepts, you hold on to the precepts, you identify with them. They become part of your identity. You're the kind of person who holds to the precepts. And that identity can help you when you feel tempted to break the precepts. You realize that you would be steeping, <coughs> excuse me, stooping to a lower level, something that's not really appropriate for you. Anything that would tempt you to break the precepts or any action of breaking the precepts, you have to label as not self. For instance, the Buddha says there are five kinds of loss, three of which she says are not important, not serious. Now, when we listen to his list of things that are not serious, we find that a lot of things that are on that list are ranked by the world as very serious. Loss of wealth, loss of your health, loss of relatives. But as the Buddha said, you don't go to hell because of losing those things. And when you lose them, you get them back, as you have many, many times in the past. What's serious, he says, is loss of virtue and loss of your right view. This is an area where the world says, oh, those things are not important. So you can see the Buddha's values are very different from most people's. Because if you lose your virtue, you're going to create the kind of karma that could pull you down for a long time to come. You lose your right view, you're tempted to do anything at all, because you feel that your actions have no consequences, they're not real, so you don't have to be careful. And that attitude can be really detrimental for many, many lifetimes. So things like that, you say, are not self. You realize your wealth isn't really yours. Even your health isn't really yours. It's nothing you can hold on to and direct. You can make some adjustments in your, the way you live, the way you eat. But you can't guarantee that they'll keep you healthy. Back when I was younger, there was a woman who was a famous nutritionist. She appeared all over the TV, talking about how if you ate the right vitamins, you would never get cancer. Well, sure enough, she herself got cancer. So even though we can stave off things like loss of wealth and health and relatives, to some extent the Buddha says there has to be a limit to what you'd be willing to do. In other words, you don't break the precepts, even to protect your relatives. You don't break the precepts to protect your wealth or your health. Try to maintain right view that the quality of your actions coming from the quality of your intentions is the most important thing you have to care for. So that kind of thing you want to hold on to, that you identify with. The same principle holds when you're practicing concentration. Everything that's related to being ardent, alert, mindful, focused on the topic of concentration, that's self. You're the one who's doing the meditation. You're the one who's going to benefit from it. You're the one who's watching it to make sure that you're doing it well and offer suggestions for how to do it better. But at the same time, the Buddha says you put aside greed and distress as reference to the world. That means whatever is out in the world right now, you remind yourself it's not self. It's not me, it's not mine. I have more important things to focus on. The same with discernment. And this is where the, the range of not-self starts getting bigger and bigger. As you look at the different things you, you crave and you cling to, and you realize that even though they may help you in some ways, they're actually pulling you down. So you have to regard them as not self. And you apply this to anything that's placing a burden on the mind in any way at all. Until the only thing that's left burdening the mind is the path of practice itself. You turn on that too. You say, well, this also is not self after all. Your state of concentration is made up of aggregates, the same things that make your other senses of self. 
You've got the form of the body, as you sense it through the breath. You've got feelings of pleasure. You've got the perceptions that you hold in mind about how the breath runs through the body and where you are in the body as you focus on the breath. Fabrications would be the intentions that hold you here. And there's consciousness. You have five aggregates here in the state of concentration. And you realize that you've been holding on to this as your means for letting go of other things that are less skillful. But now comes the time to let go of this as well. And then you even let go of the perception of not-self. Because that too is a perception, it's an aggregate. And that's when the mind opens up to something that is very different. Because up to this point, your sense of self and your sense of not-self, even as you've refined them and made them more and more consistent, they're still strategies, they're still done for the sake of something. But when you hit the deathless, it's not for the sake of anything. Which means that those value judgments and those strategies of self and not self no longer have any place, no longer have, play any role. So you let them go totally. All that remains is the ultimate happiness. Totally free. And as John Sowell used to say, once you've found that happiness, the question of whether there's somebody experiencing it or nobody experiencing it just wouldn't occur to you. It doesn't have any meaning at all. It's not worth asking. So the question, who is the real I, who is the real me, just gets dropped. Because you realize it, was, it came from confusion with your many senses of self and your many different senses of not-self. Once those issues have been straightened out, then the question of who is the real me has no more meaning. You don't need a me anymore. There no, there's no need for strategies, because Nibbana is not for the purpose of anything. There was a time when someone asked the Buddha, what is virtue for? Virtue is for concentration. What is concentration for? Concentration is for the purpose of discernment. What is the purpose of discernment? The purpose of discernment is to, for release. What is the purpose for release? Total unbinding, nirvana. Then the person asks, what is the purpose of nirvana? And the Buddha says, no, you've gone too far. Once you've hit nirvana, there's no more talk of purposes anymore, because you've arrived. Whereas they asked Ajahn Mahabho one time whether nibbana was self or not self. He said, nibbana is nibbana. You use concepts of self and not self, just like you use the stairs to get up to a house. Once you've gotten to the house, you don't need the stairs anymore. We've arrived. <laughs>